So this, uh, this is just a single paper, uh, just. <laughs> Uh, and uh, it's joint with uh, three, other, uh, three other friends and colleagues. And as Jared just said, they're all formerly of Chapman. So more, more uh, praise for Chapman University. Uh, Mike Caldera was a grad student here at UC Irvine. And but now he's uh, moved on to Amazon. Actually, he's not even at Amazon anymore. I have to update that. So this is the slide I can probably skip. But the short story is there's a lot of evidence and hypothesizing that uh, conflict often falls along identity boundaries, okay? Um, and so this paper is attempting to study this relationship between identity and conflict in an experimental setting. So this is the quick summary. We're going to present a very, very simple stylized model that's just meant to illustrate the kind of story that we think can be happening. And then we're going to construct and carry out a laboratory experiment uh, in which we're going to, using the Clay Kandinsky, <laughs> minimal, minimal group uh, priming for identity, we're going to study uh, whether identity and priming of identity leads to a larger rate of conflict between undergraduate students. Uh, the setting is a multi-generational, uh, multi-generational one where you have two different groups, and they're going to have. And so think of like the Hatfields and the McCoys. <laughs> Over time, you have parents and children, and their children, and their children, and their children, and where there's going to be some interaction between each generation and then a message being left to the following generation, and then a message being left to the following generation, and so on, where there, and there's potential conflict at each stage of that. And we're going to show that in this particular setting, and we're not trying to claim that this is what we should expect in all settings, but in this particular setting that we've constructed, if identity is not primed very strongly, if there's really a low sense of identity, what we're going to call identity salience, that you should see conflict happen at the start, but that it really shouldn't continue. Uh, if there's a medium amount of identity, conflict will happen at the start, but then successive generations will continue it. And if conflict, and if, but if identity uh, saliences are so high, then um, we shouldn't see conflict start at all, in theory. In anticipation of all the future conflict that will happen, the people in the first generation will not try to initiate conflict at the start. And that's a feature of the particular um, environment that we construct. Uh, and we're going to try to replicate this, um, this uh, setting in, a, in the laboratory experiment. And we're going to try to prime different ident identity saliences. And we're going to show that, uh, well, the data are going to show that we end up finding conflict starting at the same rate in every setting. However, it, the rate at which it continues varies dramatically by identity salience. So that the lower the identity, the less likely conflict is going to continue. The higher the identity salience, uh, the more likely conflict is going to continue. And so the takeaway is that the strength of social identity, and, and, the, 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 and the, the key motivation here is, right, is that in, in a lot, in a, we, we see this correlation between conflict and, and these identity boundaries in many settings. But it can be difficult to ascertain what's causing what, right? So is the identity, uh, are the, the, the strong identities and the conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, is that, did those identities form in the face of conflict? And the continuation of conflict that we see there as a result of, of identities that formed under conflict scenarios? So what we wanted to do was try to create a scenario, where, uh, create a, an experiment where we could exogenously create identities that were not formed through some other process related to conflict, and then see if just these artificial uh, identities that we create could then have this causal impact on the conflict. So we could tease out this one direction uh, of, uh, of, of the relationship between identity and conflict. Of course, exposure to conflict could come back and affect the construction of identity. We're not saying that that doesn't happen or cannot happen. Our experiment is not trying to look at that direction. We're just looking at the one direction from identity uh, 
creation to this continuation of conflict. So here's the simple environment. You have two groups. We'll call them the A's and the B's. And in each group, there's one representative per generation. So there's A1, which is the member of group A for generation one, A2 for generation two, and so on. Similar for group B. So there's non-overlapping, but multi-generational interaction. So A1 is going to interact with B1 in period one, and then they disappear. A2 is going to interact with B2 in period two, then they disappear. And then the threes come, and then the fours come and interact, and so on. And so each individual interacts in exactly once in, in its own generation. And the, the, the interaction that they're going to uh, undertake is, um, in the first period between A1 and B1 is what we call a reverse dictator game. So you're all familiar with a dictator game where someone's given a, a, an amount of money and then, they're, and, then, and then they can decide how much to give someone else. Well, in a reverse dictator game, the other person is given the money and the first person decides how much they want to take. Okay? So it's theft. That's sort of the, the framing. So in the reverse dictator game, one of the players will be the first mover and will be allowed to either do nothing and let the other person keep her endowment or pay one dollar, there's some cost, to stealing. So she can pay, the first mover can pay one dollar and then steal anywhere from one to ten. The endowment is going to be ten dollars. In the experiment it will actually be, t uh, be ten dollars. And then the second mover from the other group, who may or may not have been a victim in the, in the first period, will then leave a message for the next generation person in her group. So the message, and in the experiment, I'll show you exactly what that message looks like. In the theory, we can allow it to, to have a pretty um, general structure. But you might imagine that message could be something like, they stole from me $8 or something. You should punish them. You should punish the other person in your round or something. That's kind of what we're envisioning. If, if the first mover is a money maximizer and cares only about herself, then she should pay a dollar and steal ten. And then she's gone. Okay? So that's it in the, first, in the first generation. In all subsequent generations, however, things change slightly. So the roles are going to reverse. The group member from the group that was the second mover in period one will now be the first mover in period two. And that person will now have the opportunity not to steal money, but the opportunity to pay a dollar to destroy something that the other person has. So that if I pay, if, if I'm the first mover now, I can pay a dollar and I can destroy everything that the person I'm paired with that has, but I don't get to keep any of it. So this is this, um, uh, capturing this idea of very costly uh, destruction of conflict. There's no real individual profit motive here. In, in harming the other person. It's purely to kind of to punish, punish someone at, at a cost to myself. And then of course the second mover from that generation can leave a message for the next person from their group who will then be in the first mover role. So the first mover role alternates from period to period. If I'm a money maxer in any of these periods after period one, so period two, three, four, and five and on, I shouldn't do anything, right? Because I'm paying a dollar and I'm not getting anything else, in, I'm not getting any money in return. So if we have money maximizers, that is, if they don't care about identity, then what we should see is that we should see conflict in the first period, but then we shouldn't see conflict uh, continuing at all. Can I ask a sure. So what is this? Um, do they have an endowment? Yeah, they're going to have an endowment. Yep. So in, in the theory, it doesn't matter so much because it could, it could be positive or negative. In the experiment, they'll have an endowment of, they'll actually be given, an, they'll each, in fact, be given an endowment of $10. And in the first round, there's no way that they can have an equal allocation, is that right? No, in the first round, so they're both going to be given, both, both the first and second movers are given $10. And the first mover is in the, so it's a very asymmetric setting where the first mover can then steal even more to make, to make it unequal. Right. The first, the first period is this called reverse dictator game. The second period and on, that has a f another fancy name called the joy of destruction game. And you may have heard that, that name before. Okay, so 
if they don't care about identity or anything other than the money, then um, we should just see conflict in first period, nothing thereafter. But what if, what if they have identity? What if they, what if they have some sense that they need to stick up for the people in their group or that they need to fight back and retaliate? What if they have some sense like this? Well, you can kind of ignore the, this if you don't, if you don't want to look at it. We're going to imagine a scenario drawing inspiration from some of the models that are out there on, uh, on trying to capture social identity in, in an economic framework, in an economic model. Um, to imagine that each individual has some kind of penalty for, um, uh, not for non-conformance with what they're expected to do as a member of their group. Okay? And that's what this last term is. So this is what you're supposed to do. This is what you actually do. This is how much you remove from the other person. And then this K captures this, the salience you place on this. So that the, the greater the difference your be actual behavior is from, your, from what you're, you're expected to do as a member of this group, there's some penalty for deviating from that. And so all this equation is showing is that there's some trade-off. Right? So there's a profit part of your payoff, and then there's this identity term. And you're going to be trading off this identity payoff with your profit payoff. And so if you care enough about your identity payoff, the conformity with your group, and what, what you're expected to do as a member of that group, then you'll be willing to do things that are not profit maximizing, but that are out of this, ob this obligation you feel uh, uh, due to membership in some group. And so experimentally, the challenge uh, is trying to construct and exogenously create different levels of K. But before we get there, we have to think, well, what should the, what should the group rule be? What should be the rule that, that I undertake? And this is actually not so trivial. And so we actually, so there are lots of different norms that could be operative in a group. So for example, you could have a group that has a pacifistic norm. That group says you should never steal if you're the first person in the first round, and you should never destroy if you're the, sec if you're the first mover in any subsequent round. Okay, that's a perfectly reasonable uh, type of, uh, of norm that could be operating in a group. Uh, another norm might be something like tit for tat. Like just, you should, you should destroy whatever someone stole in a prior round. But if in, a prior, but if in your prior round nothing happened, then you shouldn't do anything. Okay, so there could be uh, uh, another, that's, a, that's another, uh, seems a sort of commonsensical rule. Well, we're going to actually try to derive what we think might be a kind of norm uh, that would be operating in these groups, and we call it a perfect identity norm. So conceptual, so mathematically, this is just applying some ideas from game theory, but conceptually, it goes like this. Imagine that each group is controlled by one person who has perfect identity with every member of that group. It's as if one person controls all the actions for that group. And, ha and cares equally about the well-being of each member of that group. So in other words, that it's going to be one person against one person. Okay, so it's a one-on-one -on -one game. What would be a, the strategy that would be an equilibrium that would maximize the well-being, just as the payoff alone, for each of the members uh, of that group? And so we can derive and show that it's a kind of grim trigger strategy that can, that can enforce an equilibrium of no, no theft in the first round with, due to threats of complete and utter punishment in any subsequent round. Okay? So a grim trigger strategy can satisfy this kind of perfect identity uh, norm. So it's an extreme setting. There could be other ones. But we think it's a simple one to illustrate this idea that with, this, with these identities, there's this threat of retaliation, but uh, at the same time, there can also be an initial offer of never starting conflict in the first place.
So if, if we use that as the norm that people can consider when they're trying to calculate what their utilities are going to be what, and identify what their, what their best action should be, then we have the following predictions. If you have low salience, well, we know that one. That's the money maximizing. You should steal $10 in the first round and then never do anything thereafter. We have initial theft, but no conflict. There's no threat of conflict thereafter. If you have super high salience, then that perfect identity norm is going to deter threat, uh, deter the, the theft in the first place. So it's like, I know that my brothers and sisters after me are going to suffer so much destruction if I steal this $10 that I don't want to steal it to prevent this continued conflict. But it's in this medium range where the threat, the, the temptation to steal is so large for the first mover, where they care about their brothers and sisters, but it's not enough to prevent them from stealing because that $10 is, oh, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of laundry you can do if you're an undergrad. <laughs> but, and, and, then they care, and then the subsequent generations care enough about their identity and the $1 cost to continuing to, to destroy everything that the, the next person has, that $1 cost is still relatively low that they're going to keep the conflict going. So it's in this medium range where we have ongoing conflict. So we see this kind of, so we've constructed a setting where there's this non-monotonic relationship between conflict and, and identity. Now, we're not saying that all settings have this kind of non-monotonic relationship, but, but we think it is interesting because um, you might have thought that, well, the, more the, the stronger the identities, the more conflict you're just going to have, period. And we're showing that, well, actually, if the identities are strong enough, then you may be able to deter conflict in the first place. OK, so we want to construct an experiment. And um, what we're going to do is um, construct an experiment with three uh, treatments to try to mimic these different levels, uh, these sort of the low, the medium, and the high. And it was a matter of, uh, uh, it was, we, we took a leap of faith here because we don't have a natural metric for constructing an identity salience experimentally. So we were just, we, we, were gonna, we just took our best chance uh, and we're pretty happy with how it happened. So in our first, um, so, so the experiment's going to go as follows. So every subject's going to, so we, and we actually did a complete multi-generational experiment. We had some subjects come into the lab and take, and, and they were one generation. And then the next day, another group of subjects came into the lab and they were another generation. And then another group of subjects came into the lab later and were, were another generation. Every subject is going to do this Clay Kandinsky um, preference revelation task. I will show you that in a second. In this first treatment condition, uh, they take they 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 reveal their preferences over these paintings, and then they're just randomly placed into groups, and they just don't know it, and, and they're just told that they're you know they're just put in these groups, and then uh, and then they and then the generations happen. So there's no identity that we're, that we're trying to prime no, no sort of sense of identity in that treatment. Uh, and we have 40 subjects in the first, 40 subjects in the second generation, 40 subjects in the uh, third generation. So we think this is the low identity setting. In the Clay Kandinsky treatment, just like these, they do this um, preference revelation for the paintings, and then we're going to place them into, group based on, into groups based on their preferences. So the subjects that, uh, um, like the, the, the had stronger preference for the clay paintings are going to be in the clay group. They're going to be told this. You're in this group with, a, you're in the clay group. And the other subjects are told they're in the Kandinsky group. I'll show you a, a slide of the experiment uh, so you can see how it looks. This is a minimal group paradigm. This is all we're doing to create the, identi the identity. And and I, and I emphasize there's no other prior interaction in the lab uh, uh, between these subjects. Okay? And, it, and the decisions are going to be quite anonymous. So they don't even know who else in the room. And I'll show you a picture of the lab. They don't know who else in the room is in their group. They just know there are some people uh, in, the, in, in the room that are in their group. And we again do 40, 
for each of uh, the three generations. And then to try to create a really high uh, identity, we, we weren't quite sure how to do this. We, our original thought, and, and this explains the Chapman connection, our original thought was to pit UC Irvine students against Chapman students. So Chapman is a smaller private university that's up the freeway. But there's really no natural hostility between uh, Irvine students and Chapman students. Uh, probably if we got USC students and UCLA students during the week they play football, that would have been better. But neither of us is at uh, either one of those universities. So we, didn't, we weren't quite sure how to, how to, to create this one-on-one, -on -one, um, this really sup this super high identity setting. So what we did was we tried to mimic perfect identity by having one person play against one person in a multi-period setting. So qualitatively, it seems quite different. Conceptually, however, it's perfect identity, right? It is literally one person who's going to be getting the payoff for each period. So, in, so theoretically, conceptually, it seems to fit exactly what we want, although qualitatively, it seems sort of somewhat different than the other, um, than the other treatments. Um, and I'll show, you, I'll show you what we get from it, but yeah. Just out of, what if you do something where the payoff depended on total payoffs across all these different periods? Would that change the structure? Well, in this setting, it will. I mean, the perfect identity. Yeah. But you could have multiple people if they were getting paid off based on some, you know, some total or average. In which, in which condition? To create a high identity group with uh -huh. different numbers. If, the pay, if their ultimate payoff depended not just on what they got in their one period, they were actually paid off. Well, we wanted to fundamentally Go ahead. Yeah, we, wanted, we didn't want to do that, right? Because we, we didn't want to pay them for the identity. We wanted it to be, we didn't want to incentivize, we didn't want to pay off incentivize the identity. We wanted it to be different from the payoff incentive. Yeah. But. The high treatment, I think it's, it's quite natural to do it like that. So philosophers Yay, think about. Yay, great. <laughs> so <laughs> philosophers think about personal identity as uh, over time as connection, psychological continuity, psychological connection between different selves of the individual. Um, and uh, you could think about this here as more generalizing identity as a psychological connection between different cells even across people. Mm -hmm. And so the, you, the Clay Kandinsky treatment is really an intermediate, it's not really minimal group in that sense. It's an it's a intermediate between perfect or, or as high as psychological connection as you can get across different cells mm -hmm. and no, no psychological mm -hmm. connection because you're still saying, this person liked the same paintings as me. There is some psychological connection. Mm -hmm. There is, they're sort of like me. There's, yeah. There, and um, whereas in the other case, they're exactly like me, perhaps yeah. some positive change or some. We, we have gotten some feedback. And maybe, I'll, maybe I'll hold this comment off and comment a little bit more on the Clay Kandinsky when I show you the pictures. But, but uh, we've gotten some other feedback similar to that. So I, I appreciate that. Yeah. In this experiment, that's exactly what we're, tr in, the, in the identity construction, in the alignment into groups, there's no, the, we don't want that to be correlated with the, with the assignment into groups, a history of conflict. Now, one thing you might think is, well, what about these people being told about conflict? Does sort of their identity salience change? from generation to generation. We can't really say anything about it. But their sorting into the groups was done separately from an exposure to conflict. That was a key part of the, yeah, it's a key part of the design, yeah. But, but your high group, in effect, has conflated identity as a psychological phenomenon with identity as a, com a, a joint payoff. Right? I mean, if you had, if you had instead of one person playing with the Jewish ground, but the different people whose payoff was somehow related to what they can collectively earn, they would not yeah. have the, they would not be the same person, uh -huh. but they would have, in your high group, both of those things are going on. So, so this is the norm and the identity so in, the, in the model, okay? Here's the money over here. The construction of the norm, the way we've derived it, using the game theory, derives this from the monetary payoffs. So I'm not saying that these are not related in some sense, okay? But 
so they are, they, they, they are related in, in that equilibrium, derivation of this, but in, in I mean, and you're, you're saying this is the qualitative difference between here and here. I, 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 but not if you interpret discounting as connection, identification with your future self. Uh, we'll talk about the Oh no, they're paid. They're paid at the end of the the interaction. They're going to be repeating indefinitely, which mimics uh, uh, an infinite horizon with discounting, because we just can't have them there forever. Um, so, yeah, I find when I presented this paper, this is the thing where some people get hung up a lot, and other people are like, "I'm with you." And within our group of co-authors, we have a similar kind of tug on, on this treatment. Uh, I was in favor of it, more in favor than some of the others, but I, I recognize some of the challenges. Okay, so what are we predicting? We're predicting in, in the one-on-one, -on -one, we're predicting, uh, I'm sorry, in first period, we're predicting the least amount of conflict with the really strong identity, and that there's some kind of ranking going in the, the, the inverse order of the identity salience. But the continue and the continuation of conflict should be the opposite. Okay, so this is what the this is a picture of our lab. So there are 40 computers. These little things you pull out. So you're you are um, sitting there in isolation. You can't see what the other people are choosing. You can't see look at look at the other person's screen. Uh, this is our lab here at UC Irvine. We use uh, UC Irvine undergraduate students uh, as subjects because they're convenient. Thanks. Um, <laughs> They're also a somewhat diverse group. Uh, UC Irvine is known for being one of the most diverse uh, undergraduate populations in the country. Um, so they come in here um, uh, with, 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 with somewhat diverse backgrounds. Um, everybody's gonna get a $7 payment for showing up and then there are gonna be additional earnings based on the choices that are make, ma made in their interactions. And as sort of a standard in experimental economics, there's no deception, the rules are you know, explained to them exactly about what the course in the interaction will be, uh, no videotaping, and, and so on. Uh, so these are some of the Clay Kandinsky pictures. So they're gonna be shown a screen, and there's gonna be these two pictures, and they're told, and they're just asked, which one do you, do you like more? Okay, so there's one of them, here's another set of pairs, and they're just gonna click a button. And you know, so, so we altered the order for which one was Clay or Kandinsky on the left or the right. <clears throat> okay, other experiments. Key point here, as, as far as we could find, um, we're the first one to look at this kind of, uh, look at the, the influence of identity uh, on uh, the continuation of conflict in this kind of multi-generational setting. We haven't, we haven't found another study that's, that's done this, but there are a tremendous amount of, Papers. It's funny that, of course, the social psychologists have done more than the economists, but we, I cite, we cited fewer of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so here's what a screen looks like. So this is, uh, you are in the Clay group and are matched with someone from the Kandinsky group. You're the sender, the other person's the receiver. You have $10 and the receiver has $10. Okay, and so on. Do you want to pay $1 to reduce the receiver's account total? So this is, this is the, like, the second generation. Okay, do you, want to, do you just want to pay that dollar, yes or no? And then, and then you'll select how much, how much you, um, you, you remove on another screen. Here's the screen uh, for uh, the second mover. You're in the Kandinsky group and are matched with someone from the Clay group. The, the sender pay, uh, chose to pay a dollar to reduce your account by six. You now have four dollars. Okay. Um, and then this is the message you can leave. Some sender from the Clay group reduced my account total by this. I would like for you to reduce the account of the receiver in the Clay group by this. So you're actually telling the, we chose a message structure to actually try to get at the kind of rules and norms that people think ought to be operating in this setting without telling them what they ought to be. People can lie here? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll show you evidence on truth telling on the next slide. So this is a summary table. So the black is the one-on-one, -on -one, the red is the Clay Kandinsky, uh, I'm sorry, the gray is the random, 
The red is the Kandinsky, and the, yeah, the black is the one-on-one. -on -one. And so this is the extensive rate of conflict, just um, how much, uh, at the rate at which conflict occurred. And you can see that in every setting, it started at the same rate, contrary to what we predicted. We're not exactly sure why. We suspect partly it's when subjects come in the lab, they kind of want to do something. <laughs> And so um, we think that might be part of it. This might be an artifact of the lab setting. We're not, we're not exactly sure. But in the subsequent generations, you can see that there's this big difference in the rate at which conflict continues in the way that we, are, we were predicting. Um, so this is just the unconditional rate of conflict. We can break it down by conditional. Here's the intensive conflict. So it's not whether conflict occurred, but it's how much was stolen how much was removed. And we see the same, we see the same general pattern. And these differences, um, when you pool these subsequent generations, um, actually, when you, even when you don't pool them, these are statistically uh, different um, rates at which conflict continues. OK, so here's on the truth telling. So in the random and the clay Kandinsky treatments, we can see that the messages overwhelmingly are truthful. When they're not truthful, we can try to identify which way did they go. Did they claim there was conflict when there wasn't? Did they claim there was peace when there wasn't? Did they exaggerate upward or downward? And so you can see that there's some, there's some difference. They're, they might be exaggerating up a little bit more so that they're saying there was conflict when there, when there wasn't, a little bit um, higher rate there. This is quite interesting, and we think this is particularly telling. And so one thing we liked, to, one, one, one aspect of the experiment we, we did intentionally was we didn't tell people what the norms ought to be in their groups. Like we could have told them, hey, you're in this group. You know, you should punish someone. We could have done that. Uh, that would be interesting to do, especially to do it in the random group and the Clay Kandinsky and see if that makes any difference. Um, but we decided not to do anything, just to see what people thought you know, to let, allow them to try to relay information about what they think the norms uh, ought to be. And here we see tremendous variation here. So in the random setting, um, if there wasn't any conflict, we see there's a high rate at which people just say, you know, you should ma maintain no conflict. It actually kind of drops as you go, oh, this is for the one-on-one, -on -one, this is the actual, uh, what actually happened. But if you just look at the Clay Kandinsky and the random, you see that there's a, a decline in the, in the amount of people that are just saying you should maintain conflict. And in eye for an eye, there's a significant increase in the type of norm that people are, are um, suggesting. Um, a reduction in the amount at which people are suggesting to de-escalate. So there is variation. Of course, there could be different, like we said before, there could be different norms that could be operating. Uh, and so there, there is, of course, a norm coordination problem that groups um, might need to solve that we're not helping them to solve so much, just a little bit by allowing them to, to share a message. But there is disagreement about what that norm should be. I can skip that. So anyway, uh, we have this setting. It's very stylized. Uh, but where we, we thought we could try to pick apart and, uh, and identify a causal relationship between the identity construction and the rate at which conflict um, continues. And um, we find that conflict does continue at higher rates, the higher, the, 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 the stronger the identity. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do to uh, look, look more at this work, but um, um, yeah, I'm sure you have some ideas. I know we have got another five minutes, so. Yeah, I was just wondering if you were going to do any. So it seems like between Clay Kandinsky and then just one person, there's a lot of space, as you were indicating. Yeah. Are you guys planning to do anything about that? I mean, I was thinking, like, if you could get sororities on campus yeah. or something like that. We thought about a lot of ideas. Yeah. Um, I would love to. Uh, we ran these experiments about six years ago, and we still don't have a finished draft of this paper. 
because everybody has scattered. We're having a hard time finishing this one. I would love to do that. We've had a lot of ideas. You could get, so our original, the original motivation for this was to do Chapman versus UCI. Um, so, but there may be some more natural uh, identity groups that we could use from on campus. We thought about that, fraternity sororities, athletic groups, other kinds of clubs. Um, I would love to do it. I, I'm not sure we're going to be able to do it anytime soon <laughs> if, the, if the length of which t length of time this paper is taken is any indication. But it's a natural thing to do. There was some, and this goes back to the Clay Kandinsky, um, the, this, the, the Clay Kandinsky priming. Some people, so I, I, have, I get mixed reactions from, from, um, uh, from people that see the, the paper. Some people think that the natural groups would be more interesting. And other people think that the Clay Kandinsky priming is, is more compelling. Um, and the argument is that we're completely constructing the identity through this. Uh, number two, it might hint, people might think that their placement into a group does reflect something really essential about who they think themselves to be. Like, I like those paintings. I'm in a group of people that are like me. They're really, they're really like me at a deeper level. I'm not sure <laughs> if that's true, but, but there, is this, there is this idea. The other thing is, I mean, how much more play can we go? I mean, if you look at this difference between the red and the black, I mean, even if we got something that was in between, it may not really give us much traction because we don't know. We don't know. Um, but I, I would love to do it. I know there was another hand. I was going to suggest, based on that, maybe you could do article screen one. <laughs> Interesting, yeah. Um, I was just looking at the next, when you're looking at the uh, amount that people like suggest not going forward with conflict, and yeah. like the actual versus the. Um, so for the one on one, it's actually the lowest that they maintain no conflict. That, and so that goes against the initial hypothesis, right, for that kind of perfect identity thing, or is it supportive of it? That, Trying to yeah. That. So, like, because in the perfect identity norm, so that before it was saying, so time one you wouldn't steal, and then to only destroy if there's theft or destruction in the previous round. Mm -hmm. So I'm just trying to, um, yeah. Am I just misinterpreting that? This is the condition. I, if I remember right, this is conditional on there being conflict. Okay. So we should be expecting them to. Okay. Can, oh, no, 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 no. That one can't be. What is this one? Maintaining no conflict. But there is, there is conflict in seventy-five percent. There's conflict in, in many of them. Oh yeah, this is this is the un, this is the un, unconditional sample, right? So some of them never had conflict and, and stay. But there's a lot of de-escalation here as well. One thing I'll tell you, it was hard, actually harder than we thought to get conflict to start. We actually tried a lot of different ideas. And the reverse dictator game was the best one. But we did try other settings. Uh-oh. No? I don't think I answered your question. No, it's OK. But also, just as a former undergrad Chapman alum, something that might work identity-wise. So I mean, like there's a sorority. Well, I don't really know how you would do this, because it would almost be more like a work and subject thing. But like, so there's fraternities, sororities, and students there have like pretty high identity with that. But then there are a lot of people honor societies or different things like that's so like they're a part of it but I think like the identity thing is a lot less salient there so that might be something to play with potentially I don't know like specifically for that campus but. yeah thank you um, Kimberly are you gonna let me do one, one more, more? One more Christian I think you had your hand up for a while oh yeah, oh, yeah okay. so uh, Jared said Yes. You get together once, sign the truth, and then from there on you actually have peace because you have a vendetta. Um, and so I was wondering, couldn't you quite easily in this example make that by so, so you're grouping just by ordinal ranking, are you clay or the other? Uh, but 
people can miss the cardinal ranking after treatment, right? After We've thought of that. After you've been treated by the method from the previous generation, you could miss the cardinal ranking and see, see the method correlated with the cardinal ranking. I, I think we can do that. We've, we've talked about it. We haven't done it yet. But we think that would also be interesting to look at I did, seeing if their sense of there's the strength of their association with the group changes after the exposure to conflict. Yeah. We think that would be very interesting. I agree. Yeah. OK, let's thank Mike. <laughs>